Hey guys, Jeremiah with Q&A Gaming here, and today I thought we'd go over how to play Robinson Crusoe, Adventures on the Curse Style. In Robinson Crusoe, you and your friends play cooperatively to try to survive different scenarios that are presented by living on a deserted island. The game is for one to four players, and I find it plays best with around three to four. So let's go ahead and see how the game's set up, I'll go over how it's played, and I'll come back to you with my thoughts. Robinson Crusoe is a scenario-based game with each scenario placing you on a different island with different challenges. For example, you may be on a cursed island that's haunted, you may be on an island with an active volcano, or you may be on an island surrounded by cannibals. For your first game, the rulebook and I recommend you go ahead and use scenario one, Castaways. Castaways is your basic Robinson Crusoe scenario where you need to survive on a deserted island for one year and then escape. Every scenario card is laid out a little bit differently, but they have the same information provided on them in different areas. Most of them will have some kind of turn tracker to keep track of how long the game's been played. Here you see the 12 turns or 12 months we'll have. They'll have some kind of scenario descriptor to explain what's going on. Here it tells us we've washed up on this deserted island and need to escape. It'll tell you the goal of this scenario along with any unique rules. So the goal of this scenario is to build a large pile of wood, discover fire, and then use that to signal a passing boat in the last three months of the year. Then it has special rules that go into the actual details of how the game, or game is played that we'll go over later, but for now you'll know that these are the discovery tokens and what they mean, what to do if you draw a book icon, what tiki's mean on the map, and sometimes they'll have uh, unique inventions you can build for that scenario. They'll also have a place that you can keep track of your successful games and how many victory points you get for winning that game. Once you've decided on the scenario you want to play, go ahead and find the character cards, shuffle them up, and deal out one to each player. The character cards are laid out pretty simply. On the left, it'll show a picture of your character, along with four slots for debilitating injuries your, your character could possibly incur. On the back, it'll show the character of the opposite gender. At the top, it will show that character's name slash profession. In the middle, it will show four abilities that is unique to your character. On the right, it will show an invention that is unique to your character. And on the bottom, it'll show your health track. Once each player has a character card, go ahead and give each player a red life tracker cube to put the starting square slot of their life track at the bottom. Then find the unique invention listed on the right hand side of your character sheet and place it undiscovered side up. That'll be the one with the name in the middle of the card here to the right of their track where it's shown. And then have each player find two pawns of whatever color they wish to represent them in the game. If there are only two players, only the carpenter, explorer, and cook characters should be used as these will result in a more balanced team for a reduced number of players. In addition, if there's only two of you, you'll get the assistance of the Friday non-player character. Find his card, his white work pawn, and then give him a life tracker cube at the beginning of his life track in the middle of his card. We'll go over the rules for how to use Friday once we actually get into the game, but for now, set him off to the side. In addition, if you've played the game once or twice and are having difficulty with it, you can add the dog character and his purple work pawn to assist you and reduce the difficulty of the game a little bit. Again, we'll go over how to use the dog once we get into the gameplay section. Once all players have their starting character card, it's time to go ahead and set up the game board. Start by finding a white cube and placing it at the center of the morale track at the top of the board. It'll be the zero in the very center, and this will represent the party's starting morale once the adventure begins. Then, take a black cube and place it on the skull in the top right-hand side of the board. This is the party's weapon level track, and the skull represents the weapon level starting at zero. Once that's done, find the nine invention cards with little triangles around the name of the card in the center. These will be your nine starting inventions and place these out on the board like this. I recommend placing the shovel card in the first position and I'll explain why here in a bit. Once those nine are placed, take the remaining invention cards, shuffle them up, and deal out five more. These will be your starting inventions you'll have available for you to build once the game actually begins. Now find the three adventure decks. Each one of these will have a large question mark on the back with a unique symbol where the period would be. There's one brown, one gray, and one green. Take each of them, shuffle them up, and place them on their associated spot on the game board in this order. Brown, gray, and green. Each deck will also have a set of three dice of a similar color associated with it. I recommend placing these somewhere near them on the game board so they'll be easily found once the game begins. Next, find the starting map tile. The starting map tile is labeled with an 8 at the bottom of the tile and has a picture of a sandy beach in the middle. On the back is a large picture of a volcano, so it's pretty easy to find. 
Take the starting map tile and place it on the leftmost slot on the map in the center of the game board. Then, take the camp token and place it X side up on this tile. This will be the starting location of your team's camp. Next, find the event cards. The regular event cards are black with a greenish flag in the center. Separate these cards into two piles. One pile will have a question mark at the top center of each card. The other pile will have a book at the top center of each card. Then, take the number of rounds in the game, divide it by two, round up, and take that many cards from each pile. So we have a 12 round game for the first scenario, so we would take six cards from each pile. Take those cards, shuffle them up, and place them at the top of the board right here. Then, take the starting event cards. These cards are blue with a goldish flag in the center. Normally, you would take these three cards, shuffle them up, and choose one randomly. But for your first game, it recommends using the Food Crates card. Take the Food Crates card and place it in the right slot of the journal in the bottom left-hand corner of the game board right here. Find the starting item deck. Shuffle it up and draw out two cards randomly. Place the two cards somewhere near the game board, and these will be items that your party has access to as soon as the game begins. Lastly, take the remaining map tiles, the adventure deck, the discovery tokens, and the beast deck. Take each of these decks, shuffle them up, and place them somewhere near the game board everyone can reach them. Take note, the beast deck does not go in the hunting space of the game board. Then, give the youngest player the starting player token and you're ready to begin. However, if this is a four player game, take this card and place it here overlapping this space on the game board, as it will reduce this space effectiveness in a four player game. Then, you're ready to begin. Just take a white square and place it over top round one of the castaways scenario card and you're ready to play. Now that you're all set up and ready to play, let's review the objective of the game. Remember, Robinson Crusoe is a scenario-based game, so each scenario has a different objective. In the starting scenario Castaways, you're trying to build a signal fire by the end of a 12-month period to signal a boat and escape the island. How do you lose? Well, you lose Robinson Crusoe the same way no matter what scenario you're playing. Remember, Robinson Crusoe is a survival-based game, so if any member of your team dies, you all lose. Also, if you run out of time on the scenario track board, you lose. Robinson Crusoe uh, is comprised of six phases every turn. There's the event phase, the morale phase, the production phase, the planning phase, the weather phase, and the night phase. So let's go into each of these phases in detail and then we'll see how a game turn plays out. The first phase of the turn is the event phase. You'll notice that every phase on the board is numbered and underneath the event deck is the number one. That's because the event deck is actually where you execute the event phase. During the first turn of the game, the event phase is skipped because remember you have a starting event down here at the bottom. After that, at the beginning of the turn, the first player will go ahead and draw the top card of the deck. They'll read the title of the card, followed by the flavor text in italics, and then execute the, effect, the effects right on the bottom of the card. So let's go ahead and do that. Strong wind. The wind hits the camp again and again. Working today won't be easy. Then we see this card has a book on it. Every scenario will have a different effect given to the book. So let's go ahead and look at our scenario. Castaways. We see the book has no effect. So that's great. Let's go ahead and read the rest of the card. Put a minus one worker token on the building action field. So we'll take a minus one worker token and put it on the building action uh, deck for now. And I'll explain what all this means here in a bit. After that, you can ignore the rest of the card and it's placed in the right hand slot of the journal at the bottom of the deck, or I'm sorry, at the bottom of the board. If there's already a card here, that card is pushed to the left. Now, if a third card were to be drawn and there's no space left on the journal, the leftmost card is shoved off the board. When that happens, the, the effect written at the bottom of the card occurs. You'll notice for food crates, it says nothing happens. Now that's pretty not, that's not too bad, but most cards will have a very negative effect. So let's look at the strong wind card we drew. It says, if possible, turn one item face up to invention side and cancel its effect. So basically it destroys an invention we created. Now, there are ways to discard these cards once they've, once they've been placed down here uh, during the planning phase, and we'll go over that here in a minute. The next phase of the turn is pretty simple. It's the morale phase. During the morale phase, the first player will look at the morale track and gain either the benefit or the detriment written there. If the morale track is in the negative, the first player will lose a number of inspiration tokens equal to the number written. If the player does not have enough inspiration tokens, they will instead lose that many life points. 
if the morale track is in the positive, they'll gain inspiration tokens. And if the morale track is actually maxed out, they'll have the option of either gaining inspiration tokens or one life point. The third phase of the turn is the production phase. During this phase, players will produce resources from wherever their home camp is located. Since we are on the starting tile, we see that we'll produce one wood and one food. Sometimes the food will be a different animal here, but as long as it's an animal, it's always a food token. We'll take those resources, one wood and one decomposable food as a yellow cube, and place them in the bottom section of this box up here. Sometimes the players will get inventions that will actually allow them pr to produce more resources during this phase, but for now, that's all we're going to start with. The next phase of the game is the action phase. This is where the majority of gameplay takes place in Robinson Crusoe, and it's broken up into two parts, planning your actions and then resolving them. So when you're planning your actions, players will openly discuss to one another what actions they believe each other should take, and they'll simultaneously place their pawns on those actions, and then they'll resolve them. So the actions available to you are listed at the bottom, from, uh, down here at the bottom of the board, and we'll go over them from left to right. So the first thing you have available to you is that you can resolve one of these threat cards down here. So we'll go ahead and look at food crates again. And we see that on the bottom, if we place one pawn, we gain one food, and then we can discard this card. Or if we place two pawns, we can gain a food and a non-perishable food, which is what that little hourglass right mean, uh, means in the corner there, and then discard the card. Now, getting rid of the uh, food crates card isn't a big deal because it has no negative effect if it falls off the board. But a lot of these cards, like we saw earlier, for example, this uh, Raging River right here, will have some nasty effect. So it's a good idea to go ahead and get rid of these cards. Now, some of them will have different requirements. Like, for example, this one says you need one pawn and a shovel, and they'll give different rewards. So it's a good idea to go ahead and take care of these as they pop up. So let's go ahead and say that Orange is going to spend two of his tokens. Eh, let's just, yeah, we'll say two tokens to go ahead and get rid of the, uh, the food crates down here. Now, you have two pawns available for each player, and players can go ahead and split these pawns up or pair them together to go ahead and take care of actions. Players can also team up. So let's say Orange is going to spend one guy down here, and Yellow will also spend a guy. The player who places their pawn on top of the stack, so like Yellow is placing his guy on top here, is said to be the leader in that action, and they'll receive any unique negative or positive benefits for taking that action. These guys are going to team up to open up the food crates. Okay. The next action available is the hunt action. And you'll see here that it says it requires two pawns to go ahead and resolve this action. The hunt action can only be taken if there is a card in the hunting deck. And there won't be any here initially, but we'll go ahead and put one here so we can take this action. And again, it requires two pawns. So we'll go ahead and say that, you know what, orange and yellow are going to team up again. This time, orange is going to take the lead. So we'll place these two guys right here, taking the hunt action. And we'll go ahead and uh, go over how to resolve that here uh, in a bit. The next action available is the build action, and you don't actually place your pawns here to take a build action. There's different things you can build. You can build either um, an invention up here if you meet the, prerequ the prerequisites li listed at the top of the card. You can attempt to build your shelter if you don't have one yet, and we don't because we have a little X on our uh, shelter pawn. If you've built a shelter, you can upgrade either the shelter's roof or the palisade wall around your shelter. And lastly, you can attempt to upgrade your weapon. So let's go over each of those things real quick. First, if you want to go ahead and build an invention, you have to meet the prerequisites listed at the top of the invention card. And we can see for the shovel, it just requires that you have located a beach. And since we start on the beach, that's not a problem at all. So the shovel is always going to be available to build at the beginning of the game. And a uh, nice little way to note uh, when you have access to resources, place a little black cube over top of the ones that you've met the requirements for. So that's why I set that on top of the shovel like that. And then you go ahead and take one of your pawns. So let's go ahead and say uh, blue is going to attempt to build a shovel. And you can place one right there. Now, if you place one pawn, there is a chance of failure when you do the build action. Two pawns is a guaranteed chance of success. But blue's feeling lucky. He's just going to place one there. Second thing you can build, like I said, is the... Uh, build your shelter. And the requirements for either building or upgrading your shelter uh, vary based on the number of players. So we can see for three players here, let's go ahead and zoom in on that. For three players, it requires either uh, three wood or two animal hide. So we'll go ahead and just pretend we're playing with three players for now. So that'll be the requirements for that. But we do not have three wood or two animal hides, so we could not take that action. We only have one wood and one food from the initial production phase. 
And the last action we have available to us is we can upgrade our weapon, which costs one wood and upgrades the group's weapon if you're successful. So let's go ahead and say, uh, nah, we're not going to worry about that. Okay, the next action available is the gather action. The gather action will allow you to gather resources from around uh, tiles that are near your camp. So let's go ahead and add a couple tiles so we can pretend we can do that real quick. Add these two tiles. Let's go ahead and zoom in over here. Now, you can see uh, there's resources available nearby. So when you want to take the gather action, you just take one of your pawns and place it on a resource that is one or two spaces away from your home camp. So let's go ahead and say we wanted to gather this uh, food resource right here. Again, if you place one pawn, you have a chance of failure. Two pawns is a guaranteed success. Now, you can go two spaces away from your camp, like so. Let's say we wanted to gather this uh, wood resource out here. However, when you do that, you get a negative one pawn penalty, meaning now two pawns has a chance of failure, and it requires three pawns for a guaranteed success. So that's something to note. We'll go ahead and just let uh, yeah, we'll let Black attempt to gather this uh, food resource right here. That's the gather action. Again, he's only going to use one pawn, so he has a chance of failure, and we'll go over how to resolve those here in a minute. The next action available to you is the um, explore action. When you explore, you can explore either one or two spaces away from camp. Let's go ahead and look at that again. Let's zoom over here. Now, when you explore, you choose a blank tile on the island, one or two spaces away from your camp, and you place a pawn there and attempt to uncover that tile. This works exactly like the gather action. One will have a chance of failure, and two will be guaranteed success. And again, you can go ahead and explore two spaces away from your camp if you want, but you'll get the negative one pawn penalty again. So this will be still be a uh, chance of failure out here. You cannot... Um, you cannot explore the island patchwork. So for example, say this uh, tile wasn't here, you could not explore this tile out here next. You have to keep the island as one continuous body of land, if that makes sense. Okay, so that's the explore action. We'll say that uh, black and blue are gonna help each other out over here and they're gonna go ahead and explore that one for us. The last two actions available to you, there is the clean up the camp action here and for every pawn placed here that player will gain two inspiration tokens and improve morale by one now remember if you're playing a four player game that action will be different instead you will gain either two inspiration tokens or improve morale by one for each pawn placed here and there can be as many pawns placed here as the players want and the last action available is the rest action which will gain each player, oh, which will gain the player that places the pawn here one life for each pawn placed. Okay, so those are all the actions. Now let's go over how we resolve those actions. Okay, now that we've planned out our actions for the turn, we can go ahead and resolve them. And now technically, all of these actions are being resolved at the same time, but realistically, you have to do them individually. So we'll go ahead and resolve our actions from left to right on the bottom of the board here so we don't miss anything. So we'll go ahead and start with the crisis card or threat card, whatever you want to call it down here. Food crates, we had two pawns on there, so we'll go ahead and see here that with two pawns, we get one food and one non-perishable food. And then we discard the card. So we'll go ahead and discard this card. The players will take their pawns back, and then we'll gain one food and one non-perishable food, denoted by being an orange cube. And these cubes get placed in the top of the chest up here as opposed to the bottom. And the reason we do that is because we want to designate which resources we just gained uh, during this phase and which ones we had access to at the beginning of the phase. Because, for example, let's say the black player is out here chopping down a tree, the blue player then couldn't use that wood to build a shovel because it's technically being done at the same time. So we want to go ahead and designate which ones we just gained and which ones we already had access to, so that way players aren't pulling from this pool of resources to do the actions that they designated for this turn. Okay, moving on. The hunt action is next, and the hunt action, uh, I'm sorry, whenever you take an action where you stack two pawns of separate collars, um, it's important to denote which one is on top because that player is the lead player for that action, which is particularly important when you're hunting because it's very dangerous. So whenever you're hunting, you go ahead and uh, draw the top card of this deck, and you resolve it from left to right. So we're fighting a condor here. 
The first thing you do is you compare the first number uh, in the first column to your current weapon level. Well, our weapon level is zero, so we just started. Um, and if your weapon level is less than the animal's strength value, you receive damage equal to the difference. So in this case, the lead player orange would take three damage, and we'll go ahead and denote that on his track here in a minute. Okay, because he's basically fighting a condor with his bare hands. <laughs> Moving on, uh, then this is the second column, is how much damage it does to your weapon. So we would reduce our weapon level by one. But since our weapon level is zero, instead we take a damage. And again, that would be the lead player that does that. And the second, the last two columns are the rewards you'll receive. So we see the condor will give us three food and no animal hide when we, just, when we uh, kill it. And then some will have a bonus or nasty effect down here at the bottom, but we'll go ahead and ignore that for now. So we see that we'll take four damage, three for the fight and one for the weapon level, and gain three food. Then this card gets discarded. The players take their pawns back, and we'll take that three food and put it at the top of our uh, little chest up here. Okay, now we move on to the build action right here. Now, we only have one pawn put on the shovel to go ahead and build it. When you only have one pawn, you are forced to roll the dice associated with that action. So because we're trying to build action, which is the brown deck, we roll the brown dice. Each of these dice are different. The first die has either a blank or a broken heart symbol on it. The second die has either a blank or a question mark on it. And the final die has either two determination tokens or the Robinson Crusoe symbol on it. So you roll these dice, and you resolve them in the order I just showed you. If the first die is a blank, nothing happens. If it has a broken heart, you take one wound. The second die is a blank, nothing happens. If it has a question mark, you'll draw the top card of that deck, which I'm not going to do now because these are pretty much all nasty, and they tell you exactly what to do on them. And the third die has either two determination... Oh, okay, I told you that. The two determination tokens means that you have failed the action, but you'll gain two determination tokens because you are determined next time to go ahead and get that action resolved. And the Robinson Crusoe symbol means you have succeeded, uh, succeeded in the action. So let's go ahead and roll these dice. Okay, so we see that we have taken one wound, we do not draw a card, and we were successful. So when we're successful, we'll go ahead and take the pawn back. We take the invention card. Try to take the invention card. And we flip it to its uh, item side, so we see that we've now built the shovel. And we don't put it back where it was, because remember, we don't have access to this yet. We put it instead at the top of our chest with the rest of our resources. As far as resolving other build actions, uh, once you build a shelter, you simply take the uh, base icon and you flip it over to the shelter side, like that. Um, if you use the upgrade action, which will hold on a second. Once you uh, build the shelter, you go ahead and place one of these black cubes on the zero of both the roof and palisade wall tracks. And then once you use the build action to upgrade them, you'll simply move these down on the track for every successful time you upgrade them. And same thing with the weapon track over here. Every successful build action used on the weapon track will just move your weapon level up one. Okay, so that's the build action resolved. Next is the gather action. We have one black pawn, one space away from our camp, attempting to gather food. So again, because we have one pawn, we're forced to roll. So we go ahead and roll the dice, and we see that we got two blanks on the first dice, first dies, whatever you want to call it, and we got a success. So we'll go ahead and take our pawn back, and because he was attempting a gather action on a food resource, we gain another food to the top of the chest over here. Okay, next we do the Explore actions. We see these two guys are teaming up for a automatic success, successful explore because they were only one space away, so they didn't get the minus one pawn penalty. They'll take their two pawns back, then they will draw the top tile of the island tile deck, and we'll flip it over. And at this point, we see the various benefits we're going to gain here. So first thing you want to do is look at the very center of the tile, this diamond shape right here, and we see that we've uncovered the hills uh, biome. So you'll want to go over to your invention cards over here and find any hills you have. So we see here on the bricks, they match that icon. And we would take a black cube and go ahead and place it on top of the symbol there to show that we now have access to the resources needed to build those bricks. Let's look at some of the other things here. We see that there's a little picture of an animal, a uh, beast card right here. So when we see that, we would draw the top card of the beast deck. 
here, and we would add it to the hunting deck here. Now, if there's already a card here, you put it here and then you shuffle the cards up because you don't want to know which animal came from where. And That's just what the rule book says. <laughs> okay. Then um, we see that there are two of these uh, little disc icons. Those are discovery tokens. Discovery tokens, you should draw, well, well, whenever you find discovery tokens, you'll draw them randomly. They have a, the same symbol on the back of them that these have here, and on the front they have various bonuses you can get. So let's just say we drew this treasure chest, and I'll go over how to use that here in a minute. And again, this gets placed in the top of the chest over here. Okay. And the last thing we see on here that you probably don't recognize is this little tiki icon. And the tiki icon is different for every scenario you do. Sometimes there'll be dungeons, sometimes there'll be a cursed biome, sometimes there'll be a person there, you never know. So we go ahead and look at our uh, scenario card, and we see that the tiki has no effect. Okay. So we don't do anything with Tiki this uh, this game. And we go ahead and place it where we took the action right here. If you're taking multiple Discover actions and you have to roll the dice, it's important you to note which one you're rolling for at a certain time. That way you, uh, you stay consistent. Okay, so that's placed there. One other icon that you might uh, uncover that you haven't seen before is this one right here. That is a natural shelter, so think of like a cave or something. And if you have the natural shelter, you can go ahead and... Uh, use that as a temporary shelter until you have a permanent one, permanent one built. And we'll get to what bonuses having a shelter gives you here in a minute. And then we would resolve the last two actions that anyone had taken, either the uh, arranging the camp or the arrest action. Once the, uh, once the resolving action step is all done, go ahead and take all the resources that were at the top of the chest and move them to the bottom. Take your item, put it back where it was, and that is the action phase. The fifth phase of the game is the weather phase, which is done down here in the bottom right-hand corner of the board. You can see the number five right there. And during the weather phase, you're required to roll the weather dice. Now, to figure out which dice you're required to roll, go ahead and look at your scenario cards. Let's look at castaways here. And we can see that during the first three months, we are not required to roll any. During the second three months, we have to roll the orange die. And during the last six months, we roll all three dice. So let's look at those dice. So we'll look at the orange one first, because that's the first one we're ever required to roll. And we see that it either has one rainy cloud, two rainy clouds, or one snowflake cloud. The white die has either two rainy clouds, one snowflake cloud, or two snowflake clouds. And the red die has either a blank, a palisade wall with a crack in it, uh, a banana with a little slashy mark through it, or a skull with the number three written on it. So the way you resolve these dice is first you want to see how many snowflakes you got. So let's pretend we rolled something like something like this. Okay, so we got two snowflakes. That's how cold it is. So that's how many pieces of wood we're required to burn to keep warm. So we know we have one piece of wood in our chest up here. That's all we have is one. So we would burn that wood. If you can't burn enough wood to mitigate the number of snowflakes you have, you guys all take damage equal to the difference. So in this case, because we only have one wood to burn and we had two snowflakes, everybody on the team would take one damage from the cold. Second, you count how many clouds there are. Whether they're snowflake clouds or rainy clouds doesn't matter. So we have three clouds in this case, and that's how much precipitation there is, okay? So then you take the difference between the number of clouds and the current level of your roof, because you know the roof keeps the rain off of you. So let's say we had a level one roof in this case. We don't, but we'll pretend we do. So the difference would be two. That's how much rain washes away your resources. So because the difference is two, we lose two of each of our resources. Two food and two wood, because the rain washes it away and our roof couldn't hold it off. So we would lose two food, and then we, we already know we're out of wood, so instead everybody takes a damage since we can't get up the wood. So now everyone takes another two damage. You can see the weather phase is brutal. Okay, the last die you resolve is the red die. If it's a blank, obviously nothing happens. A red uh, cracked palisade wall means that your shelter's uh, wall level goes down by one. If it's already at zero, again, everyone takes a damage. The red banana with a slash through it means that an animal came along and took some of your food. 
So, you lose another food. Whoop. If you can't lose a food, everybody takes a damage. And the last one is... Oh, find it. You get attacked by a wild animal of strength 3. The first player is required to fight the, the uh, wild animal with whatever your current weapon level is. So our current weapon level is 0. They would take the damage and difference. 3 damage. Brutal. Okay, so once the weather phase is resolved, you can go ahead and move on to the next phase. And I just go ahead and leave the dice down here in the bottom right-hand corner so you can remember uh, what dice you have to roll that turn. The final phase of the game is the night phase, and you can see that denoted by the number 6 over here in the bottom corner of the game board. During the night phase, each character is required to eat one food. They can eat either a perishable food or a non-perishable food. Each character needs one food to eat, so we'll say we have three characters in this case, so three food would feed our whole team. If for some reason we do not have enough food to feed our whole team, any character that does not eat takes two damage. Once that's done, you check if you have a shelter or not. If you have a shelter built, nothing happens. However, if you do not have a shelter and your characters are forced to sleep out in the elements, every member of your team takes one damage. Next, you have the option to move your base camp if you want. To move your base camp, just take your base camp token and move it one space on any revealed island tile. So we can move over to here if we wanted to, for example. If you already have a shelter built and you want to move your base camp, when you do so, you reduce the value of your base camp uh, roof and your base camp palisade wall by half rounded down. So you'll never reduce it lower than one by moving camp, but you are going to damage it. Once that's done, any food that is in your pack up here that is perishable, meaning yellow, rots away. So after a month, the perishable food rots away. Non-perishable food stays around, and that's why it's valuable. Any abilities your characters have refresh, and you move on to the next game round. Okay guys, now that you understand a little bit better how the game is played, let's go over some of the rules that we might have skipped or might not have made sense when we were originally uh, setting up. So first, let's look at our character sheet here. You see the life track at the bottom uh, is broken up by these little arrows. The red cube jumps these arrows as you lose life, and every time it jumps one of these arrows for the first time, the entire team loses one morale. People getting hurt doesn't tend to make people very happy. Um, but if you were to gain life and jump back across it for some reason, you don't keep losing morale. It's only the first time you jump these arrows. Second thing is player abilities can only be used once per turn. A good way to denote that is to place a black cube over top of the ability when it's used, and then at the end of the turn, go ahead and remove them to show that they're refreshed. Next, let's go over Friday. So we talked about giving Friday his white pawn whenever you set up the game. And Friday can use this pawn to go, at, go out and take actions, either assisting someone or by himself. And the rules for Friday are written at the bottom of this card. We can see that if Friday would ever be required to roll dice, he does not draw a question mark card when he rolls that symbol. Instead, he just loses one life. Friday does not require shelter, does not require food, and is unaffected by the weather. So he won't lose life due to any of these reasons. And we see his life track up here. If he ever gets to the end, he is dead. We see a special ability here, and that's Friday. The second uh, alternate character you can use is the dog. And the dog can't... Wait, he must be a little purple pawn here. <clears throat> and the dog can't do an action by himself. He can only assist a player either going out to do a green action or a red action. Or, I'm sorry, explore action or a hunt action. So that is the dog. Other thing is we talked about what happens when you draw one of these event cards and they have a book symbol here at the top. Sometimes, though, they'll have either a brown, gray, or green question mark right here. You can see that one's gray right there. When that happens, you take the token of the corresponding color with the question mark on it and place it on the deck of the corresponding color. So let's go over what some of these tokens mean. So first of all, the question mark. So we have this on the gather action here. The next time a player takes a gather action, no matter if they are automatically, automatically successful or if they have to roll the dice, and no matter what the dice roll, the player is required to draw a card. After that's done, this token is discarded. So again, that's even if you have two pawns there, you still have to draw this uh, top card. Next, we have the minus one worker token. When that's on a deck, well, again, we'll put it on the gather deck here. Now, anytime a player takes this action in the next turn, they get a minus one worker penalty. So one worker will be an automatic fail because they're getting minus one down to zero. Two workers would require them to roll the dice because it's dropping down to one. And three workers would be required for an automatic success. Once anyone takes an action uh, of the corresponding type for whatever deck this is on, 
Again, the token is discarded. The next token is this reroll token. You'll see it shows the success symbol and then a reroll little loop around it. Again, this goes on the deck. And the next time a player would roll dice for this particular action, so let's say we roll these dice here, if they get a success, this token is discarded and they're required to reroll it. And the last one is this little plus wood symbol. This goes here on top of the brown deck only, and it means that anytime you take a build action, the next item you try to build takes an extra wood to produce. There are other tokens, for example, the upgraded camp. This plus one wood token and plus one food token can be placed at your camp to give you extra uh, resources during the production phase. There are wild animals that will get bonuses. So, for example, this will give the condor down here, make it a four. There are number tokens to denote locations on the map as you discover them. Maybe dungeon number one, dungeon number two, for example. And there are weather tokens and various things that will be explained in your rulebook. The last thing I want to go over is the mystery deck. So if you recall, we got this little treasure chest symbol when we did the, uh, found our discovery token. And this is the mystery deck. One of the most fun aspects of the game, I think, because it's just left up to chance. When you go through the mystery deck, you'll be told what cards to draw. So in this case, we only draw a treasure chest. There are three types of cards in this deck. Monsters, treasures, and traps. This says, find one treasure. So we would flip over cards until we found a treasure card. This one is a animal, we'll discard it. This one is a trap, we'll discard it. And this one is a treasure, so the player would get this card. Sometimes cards will tell you to draw a certain number of cards of a certain type. So for example, let's go ahead and look at this card here. It says, uh, if you can read that and find it. Draw three, discard this card, or draw three mystery cards, only resolve one monster or one trap, and up to two chests. So even though it says to draw three mystery cards, what that actually means is draw up to three mystery cards of the type it says. So what you would do is you would take the deck like this, and you would start drawing cards. Now it says we only resolve one monster or one trap and two chests. So we flip the first card. It's a chest. We can keep that. Now if we wish, we can stop. Because we've already gotten one card. You can stop at any time, or you can keep going. So we've gotten one chest, so we, we would have the option to get one more, or one trap, or one monster. So let's be brave. Let's keep going. Oh, we got a second chest. Awesome. So we keep that. Now, obviously, you would want to stop here, but for some reason we didn't, we would keep going and we would discard it. So that's another chest, but we've already gotten two, so we would discard it. Keep going. Discard that chest. Wow, there's a lot of chests here. <laughs> and there's a monster, so we would get that one and it would kill us or hurt us or whatever. So that's how the mystery deck works. You don't have to draw any of these cards and you can stop at any time. And you, you just resolve the cards that it tells you to resolve. And that's Robinson Crusoe. Gameplay continues until one of three things happen. One, a player dies, meaning you lose. Two, you run out of rounds on your round tracker, meaning you lose. Or three, you complete the goal of the scenario, and you win. Any questions, leave them in the comments below. Thumbs up and subscribe really helps. And check out our website at qnagaming.com. And as always, thank you for watching.